Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Skillern, have you ever heard of a recording artist by the name of Alan Jackson? No, sir. Uh, well, he's a country recording artist, and he's got a song out called Here in the Real World, mm -hmm. and I suggest you buy it and listen to it for a little bit. So. Um, Mr. McPhee, uh, I continue to hear from both banks and builders in, uh, in my congressional district, and I come from a building background, a real estate background, that the uh, examiners are turning some of this regulatory guidance on uh, commercial real estate uh, into assuming that uh, if a builder has a qualified pre-sale, uh, somebody that comes in that's a qualified buyer uh, pre-sale, a lot of banks are saying, well, or regulators are saying, you're at 100 percent of your uh, uh, commercial real estate uh, exposure, so therefore you cannot make a loan to this builder to build this pre-sale house even though he has a qualified buyer. Are you, are you getting any of that from some of your banks? I know in Georgia we've had more uh, bank failures than uh, I guess any other state, 59 total and uh, six in this last year. So this is a problem that we're having, that banks are not being able to do what they do to make money, and that's to loan money. Thank you for the question, Congressman. I, um, I have heard that uh, from a number of community banks. Um, within the ICBA family uh, around the nation. And it depends on a geographic area as to how uh, serious or what level the examiners do um, criticize any new commercial loan uh, activity. I think there are areas like Texas as an example where the economy is pretty strong. They don't seem to be criticized too heavily there. But I can tell you coming from Michigan with the highest unemployment in the nation for a number of years, if, if I were a bank on the east side of Michigan doing a new commercial loan, uh, I would be heavily criticized for that. Congressman Westmoreland, may I, could I respond? Sure, absolutely. might give you a, this is a real world example. When we talk about <coughs> this, uh, our bank, with the guidelines of 300 percent of capital in CRE is also a, a component of that is construction and development, which you're not supposed to be, as you stated, over 100. Well, we were, we're at 150. And we're over that when the rule, when the guidance became a rule, so to speak. So we have yet to get down below that, even though our total concentration is below 300. But we had the real world example of a company that wanted to build their headquarters building in Oklahoma, about a $10 million headquarters building. And the problem was they came to us for the construction loan, and we went up the chain of the regulatory ladder and were told, well, even though they're going to be occupying it, and even though once they occupy it, it will be owner occupied and outside the CRE, no one occupies it during that construction, so you can't make that loan. And so to my knowledge, that loan has not been made, that building has not been constructed, and that headquarters isn't in Oklahoma. The same is true for all of our custom builders. You may have a custom house to build, but the owner doesn't live there until it's finished, so you technically can't build it without raising your CRE. To me, that's counterintuitive, but that's the rule. Yes, sir, it is counterintuitive, and, you know, until the construction business is able to come back, I'd say 60 percent of the people that are unemployed in this country right now are former construction workers, and so uh, we've got to do something to help the housing market come back. The other thing is, is the regulation about writing down uh, a toxic asset, non-performing asset, uh, to zero or to some amount, when this asset is really performing. It is a performing asset. Somebody's paying their interest every month. Uh, they're making the calls at renewal periods, but yet the regulator comes in and says, you've got to write this loan down. Uh, and the people that can't bring in any more equity, they can't even get their equity out of some of the stuff that they got now. You know, that is what, to me, is causing a lot of the bank failures. Would you agree from uh, both the banking ends of it? Well, uh, Congressman, I think you've hit exactly on the head the issue, and that is that we all know that when you have a robust economy and you make a loan, even though it's performing, if in that robust economy then falls and the value of that collateral falls, the potential of saying, we, we expect you to reappraise that, and once that's reappraised, why well, you now have an impairment on the loan, which conceivably could go to zero or could be a very large impairment, which immediately becomes a hit to capital. In the case of Georgia, as you're well aware, what happens when those banks close and the regulators then dispose of the property at a lower price, I may have a good loan, 
that's well capitalized or excuse me well collateralized but when that when the assets are sold by the by the regulator to be rid of them now my loan that was good gets a low appraisal and whoa all of a sudden i have an impairment it becomes a self fulfilling almost prophecy and it becomes the kind of the death spiral so the suspension of that type of an appraisal requirement to go in and immediately write it down and immediately impair capital is a is a serious problem thank you uh, the gentleman from georgia